Hey everyone. Just gonna wait um, for some people to join. Hello. God bless you girls for joining. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, we was on, uh, I guess, holiday break, you could say. Uh, we've been praying and seeking the Lord for what study to do next. And um, we ended up uh, picking uh, the book of Ephesians, which is one of my favorite books. Uh, it's all of our favorite books. We're, we're always uh, quoting Ephesians uh, pretty much in every study that we do. So. Um, it's very interesting um, to look at the uh, like the background of it and what's going on at the time and uh, the reason for this letter. So uh, tonight we're going to be doing an introduction. Um, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me okay? Let me know if you guys can hear me. Um, we're going to be doing an introduction. Um, so this is going to be the first two verses of Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to look... A little bit into the background, the history, um, what was going on at the time when the church started. Uh, a lot of, a lot of good stuff. So uh, I ask that you guys would be patient. It's gonna be, I'm gonna be reading, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, um, like read it and then try to expand on it a little bit because uh, I know I sometimes use big words and it's hard for people to understand. That doesn't mean I'm smart because I don't know what I'm saying half time. But uh, we'll try to break it down as easy as possible. Um, if you guys have any prayer requests while we wait for more people to join, uh, just let me know in the comments and um, we'll lift up prayers. Hey everyone. But yeah, I just ask that um, if you guys could keep um, my family in prayer. My son Ethan has something called Venus malformation. Um, that basically just means like um, his veins are kind of tangled in some areas in his leg. And um, we've been going to doctors about it. I thank God that he has no symptoms, no pain or anything. Um, doctors just wanna, you know, monitor it and make sure it doesn't get worse, um, but we're praying and we're asking God um, to show us the direction to go in to treat this problem. We've been uh, talking to the doctors about different medicines and stuff um, to put him on. And we were afraid of these medicines, but I thank God he answered our prayer by um, giving us peace. So uh, just keep us in your prayers that the Lord would continue to give us strength with my daughter-in-law. I don't know what this place is for. Amen. Yeah. Keep it in prayer. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna open up in prayer and then uh, we'll start. Let's pray. Give you all glory and honor and praise, Father, for who you are and for what you've done how you gave your son uh, to die in our place, Lord, the death that we deserve, Father, but uh, he satisfied your wrath, Father, taking our place, and then you raised him on the third day, Father. Um, you also raised us with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. You've given us this beautiful gift of salvation, Father, and we can never thank you enough for all that you've done because you're so good that not only did you call us from uh, death to life, Father, but you also provide for us in uh, ways that we don't appreciate, Lord, and we kind of look over sometimes. So I just thank you, Father, that um, for all the things that you provided with our health, Lord, keeping us safe um, from this virus, Father, um, and even um, giving peace to those who lost someone to this virus, Father. I know how hard it's been. We've been hearing about so much death in these last couple months. Um, this last year, and 
I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the strength uh, to move on, Lord, and given us the strength to, and the comfort for our families. I pray, Father, that um, anyone who lost someone, especially in these last um, couple weeks during the holidays, Father, that you would comfort them, Lord, that they would feel your arms around him, that uh, you would provide for them, Lord, um, someone to minister your word to them, Lord, someone to inspire them to get into your word, Father, and seek you for who you truly are. Uh, we're praying for Phoebe Maria's daughter-in-law, Father, and Brian, Lord, we bring them to you right now, Father God, and we ask, Lord, that your will be done in their marriage, Lord. Um, we know that you don't, you don't, you don't, um, you're not okay with separation, Father, but we know that, um, you, you call all things to work according to, to your will and to your purpose, Father. And we're asking right now, Lord, that you would uh, fix their marriage, Father, and Lord, if it be your will, um, that you would um, comfort them in this time, Lord, any pity or any animosity that they may be having towards each other. I pray that they would realize that uh, you need to be the center of their marriage, Lord, and all of our marriages, Father. I'm praying, Lord, for uh, this study, Lord, I pray that we would all be blessed through this, Father, that we would uh, grow in your knowledge, Lord, and that we would grow in knowing who you are and our sanctification. And not that we would just know just for head knowledge, but that we would apply it to our lives, Father, and live according to the life you called us to live, this new life that you've given us through your Son, through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray, Lord, that anything that I say wouldn't come from me, Lord, that it wouldn't just be uh, what I want to say or my ideas put in, Lord, but that you would um, speak through me, Father, as I share your word, um, that you would show us what needs to be said um, and that we wouldn't add it, anything, Lord, or even take anything away. I pray, Father, that uh, you bless the remainder of this time. I uh, give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, so... Yeah, I guess um, if everybody's here, um, maybe you guys could share it um, to some people. Uh, this is the, the very beginning of this book. So I encourage all of you girls to grab your Bibles, read along with us, um, study it for yourself too. Um, look into the Word of God. And really, our main goal with this, um, with these studies is to to really see what the the main point the author is trying to make, the original intended purpose um, of this this book, th these letters. Um, let me just pin this comment really quick. Um, so yeah, we, we just wanna know the real intended purpose behind it. We don't wanna add um, any of our own ideas to it. So um, us girls have been praying and we've been reading together and studying even on our own and together to really get the whole idea together and glory goes to God we were able to put this uh these studies together and break it up into sections um so if everybody's here we'll start um some things that we need to know before we start uh the book of Ephesians is considered one of Paul's greatest letters by many pastors and theologians some even call Ephesians um, a theology course or a systematic theology. And as you read along with us tonight, I'm sure you guys could like, you could kind of see it, that um, you'll see theology, right? You'll see God's attributes and who God is. And then you'll see uh, anthropology, which is uh, man. It shows us who we are. Um, and, then it, and then we also see soteriology, the salvation. We see salvation through this and how... Uh, Christ brought it together. So um, it's really wonderful, amazing, amazing book. Um, so let's let's start, let's begin to read. Um, you guys can open up to Ephesians chapter one, verse one and two. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace to you from our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Before we dive in and take it apart verse by verse, um, we're going to look at the background of the history of the city of Ephesus. Um, so ancient Ephesus was one of the largest and most important cities in the Roman Empire. 
Well known for their intelligence and focus on education, they had one of the world's most impressive libraries. So um, they had one of the biggest libraries and they were very wealthy too. Um, Ephesus was um, also a harboring city. So there was lots of people coming in and lots of trade, um, but they, they were very focused on um, economics and learning uh, their children at very young ages. Um, important things like uh, philosophy, they would teach them mathematics, astronomy, measures of units. This was like at seven years old, they would start to teach these kids these things. Um, and um, they were so focused on it that we'll see um, what we, as we studied, we found um, that First Timothy is actually, when Paul writes First Timothy, um, he's actually telling Timothy to go be the pastor of the church of Ephesus. It was already established. And um, which is two years. The, the First Timothy was written two years after Paul writes to um, Ephesus. So um, he tells Timothy about, um, he warns him about these false teachers and um, he's telling him how to, how to teach proper doctrine and sound doctrine and um, about not to tickle people's ears and just gives all these instructions. Um, and then interestingly enough, so we see that how Ephesus, like you could see it through the Bible, how they started and they began with like, um, they wasn't sure, they didn't know too much. And then um, Paul sends Timothy to go correct them in these ways and pastor them and teaches them. And then actually in the book of Revelation, um, I'm, I'm going to read it real quick. But in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus talks to the church of Ephesus and uh, he commends them for their doctrinal diligence. Sorry, I can't say that. Doctrinal diligence and endurance. So they became, uh, they, they started with uh, not knowing too much, right? They had to be taught. Uh, we'll see that in, in Ephesians 1. Um, they had to be taught. And um, then Timothy goes and he pastors them. And then they became so obsessed um, with knowledge um, and knowing proper doctrine that um, they actually, did, Revelation says that they, they need to go back to their first love. They forgot their first love. Um, and I'll just, I'll read it real quick because it's kind of short. Uh, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up, for my namesake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, ear let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amazing. Um, very interesting stuff that um, these um, Ephesians were so concerned with doctrine. Even Paul talks about it in First Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Um, so with that being said, we're going to go and look on to what else was going on into the city at the time. Um, it was a harboring city, like I mentioned earlier. So um, Ephesian, uh, Ephesus was this place where uh, people would like have to pass through or come there. Um, so it became like a very important place for business and trade, right? So like ships would go there and... Um, this made the city very attractive to immigrants and merchants. So people would come from all over the world to come see Ephesus. Um, the people there had many gods that they were all free to worship as they pleased. One of the most famous being the temple of their goddess Artemis, or known as Princess Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So um, they had this giant temple. They had many gods um, and they were free to worship as many gods as they wanted, um, and they would bring their own gods to these immigrants, but they had this one 
uh, big temple, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. So it's this big temple and this big statue of this uh, goddess Artemis. Uh, yeah, Artemis. And people would travel there once a year to worship this goddess and also bring their gods and superstitions with them. This was one of the, sort, the city's major sources of income. So they would have these big festivals, right? And then people would come from all over and worship this, uh, this idol. And they would make money with the festival, with food and stuff. And that was like a big important part of the church. Uh, or This is before the church, I'm sorry. Uh, this is just a history of what was going on before Christ, before they knew the people of Ephesus were always sacrificing to these idols, and it often left them in fear of it not being enough to protect them from evil and darkness. Uh, Ephesus was like also a main place for like uh, magic and dark arts. Uh, they would practice these things, and because they were so like involved in knowledge and stuff, there was a whole bunch of spell books, and um, this was just like a common thing. In the midst of all this, Ephesus also had a large population of Jews. They kept themselves separate from all the rituals and festivals of the Gentiles. And because of this, many Gentiles viewed the Jews as intolerant and they had lots of animosity towards each other. So you have the Jews um, worshiping the God, the invisible God of the Bible, and they kind of kept themselves separate because they didn't want anything to do with these, um, these festivals and these gatherings and all these... Uh, wicked people as they would call them and then the gentiles didn't like the jews because they thought of them as intolerant like think of um i guess the best way i could put it is like um if you guys watch the news at all you could see like the um, the republicans and the democrats right they're they feel like each side's not listening to their uh what they want and uh, they're very intolerant of each other um so that that was kind of what was going on now, the history of the church is what we're going to get into next. So this is how the church started. Um, during Paul's second missionary journey, around 52 AD, he visited Ephesus after leaving Corinth. He brought a Jewish man named Aquila and his wife Priscilla with him, who he met in Corinth and worked with them in the tent making business. Uh, you can read about this in Acts chapter 18. Um, and I suggest you read 18, 19, and 20. It'll show you like where it all started from the very beginning. Uh, Paul went into the synagogues in Ephesus and reasoned with the Jews. They asked him to stay for longer, but he declined. Before he left them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And then Paul set sail for Antioch. So during the second missionary journey, he made a stop um, to the city of Ephesus. And um, he brought, I'm sorry, Aquila and Priscilla with him. Um, Priscilla and Aquila was from Corinth. They found each other there in the city of Corinth and they were making tents together. They were in the tent making business and Paul was too. So they kind of connected that way and became friends. And uh, they went with Paul to Ephesus. They sailed with him. Um, so they made their way to Ephesus and Paul actually left them there um, after he went to the synagogue. So he went to these Jews and um, was teaching them and telling them about Christ. They wanted him to stay, and, and he told them, I will return to you if God wills. Um, so then he left for Antioch. So remember, uh, Quilla and Priscilla stood behind, and uh, during this time, Apollos came and was preaching to the Ephesians. Although he only knew of the baptism of John, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside privately and taught him more accurately about Christ's finished work and the seal of the Holy Spirit. Um, so Apollos came and he was teaching and he was teaching accurately, the Bible tells us. Um, but he didn't know of, you know, the, the finished work of Christ. He didn't know about the seal of the Holy Spirit. Um, they were baptized in the baptism of John. So when Priscilla Aquila kind of took him aside and it was kind of like um, a small group. If you think of like a small group, they had like a little uh, meeting in their house and they corrected him. And um, he he believed and he went on to continue um, preaching and um, I can't remember where he went from there. It tells you in Acts, but he left on from there and he continued to like uh, debate and refute uh, the Jews on this and talk about Christ. So the church started there and basically a small group and it began to grow. In Acts chapter 19, Paul returns to the city of Ephesus um, and when he came back, this was like... 
I guess a few months later, I had it written down somewhere, but Paul came back. So he, he went to Antioch and then he had to return that way. So he made a stop there and, um, he actually stood a little bit longer, like, like he said, um, and he was teaching, uh, the Jews there in the synagogues. And it says that, um, some of the Jews became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of Jesus. Um, so Paul dusted his feet from them and took his disciples with him and went to preach to the Gentiles uh, in the theater where people came. Okay, so Paul was preaching to these Jews. Um, some of them became stubborn. Um, they continued in unbelief. So even after those months of him trying to teach them, they still rejected it. Um, so Paul kind of dusted his feet and said, you know what, I'm going to go to the Gentiles and preach. So he went to, um, it, it was a theater. So the theater at the time was this place where, um, people would come to like have public speaking or, uh, debates or just come speak their minds. So Paul, uh, went there with, um, some disciples and he, uh, he spoke for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jew and Gentile. So the two years he stood speaking there, uh, he preached the gospel and people got saved through this. Uh, it says so many people converted to Christianity that there was a significant drop off of the number who came, a number of people who came to worship Artemis. So remember that these thousands of people were coming um, from all over the world or all over the province of Asia to come worship this goddess once a year. And now Paul stays there two years preaching on the street and uh, people get saved. Um, you could read about it and um, read more about it in Acts 19 where um, there was there was this situation where uh, the sons of Sceva uh, tried to take a demon out of somebody. They tried to perform an exorcism and they said, uh, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the one who Paul preaches. And um, we read there that the the evil spirit said, Jesus, we know, Paul, we heard of, but we don't know you. And it says that they attacked him. And then um, so many people seen that and they were so afraid that it says that they burned um, all their magic books, all their spell books, and they repented right there. It says um, in Acts, it tells us that it was uh, equivalent to 50,000 pieces of silver. That's how many books were burned. Um, if you counted to value them, it was 50,000 pieces of silver. And that truly is amazing. So this church is growing rapidly. Um, and then Paul writes, so now we get to the actual letter of Ephesians. Now that we know a little bit of the background. Um, the actual book of Ephesians, the letter, Paul writes this letter to the church about six years after he left, which would be around 62 AD. So this is about six years after he uh, left them and continued on. Um, he was under house arrest at the time where he also wrote Colossians and Philemon. Uh, he writes to the church concerning a division between the Jews and the Gentiles, each group believing they were superior or better than the other. So what happened was these Jews at the time who converted to Christianity and so did Gentiles, they were now in one church, right? Um, they both believe in Christ, but um, there was still kind of that animosity there like we read at the beginning um, because the Gentiles kind of brought a lot of their superstitions with them and their old worldview or the way of thinking. Um, they were, the Jews didn't like that and they thought that like, how can the Gentiles be saved? Um, we're originally the people of God. How are they going to be children of the promise? Um, and then the, the Gentiles didn't like the Jews for that and the Jews didn't like the Gentiles. Um, so that's why this letter was written from Paul. Uh, he was under uh, house arrest at the time. So he was in Rome and he wrote this to them. Um, I think something beautiful about the book of Ephesians, it could, it could be split into two parts. Um, so chapters one through three, Paul teaches, here's what we should believe as Christians. And chapters four through six are here how, here's how we should live according to what we believe, right? So he'll give you, um, here's our doctrine, here's your conduct. And um, that's basically how, how you could split it up. Um, 
chapter one opens with a beautiful explanation of the triune work of salvation. Now we're going to learn uh, about this next week. I think uh, Candy and Delilah is doing this. But it really is so beautiful. Uh, I was reading somewhere that these first um, verses, I think one through ten, are a Jewish poem. Paul opens with a Jewish poem and it's explaining the triune work of salvation. So all uh, three roles. So all three persons of the Trinity and their work in the role of salvation. Um, we will learn about how we were predestined before the foundations of the world to be adopted as sons and daughters to God through the finished work of the cross in Christ Jesus and about the inheritance that is promised to us by being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' death covers our worst sins and our worst failures and in Jesus we find God's amazing grace. I'm going to read, um, this is chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Um, it says, this is in Ephesians, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Um, and I think another important part of this whole study is um, that this was never God's plan B. Like God didn't save the Jews first or uh, he sent Christ to die for just the Jews. Salvation was just the Jews. And then he felt bad for the Gentiles or us. And then he decided, okay, well, I guess I'll save them too. Uh, the Bible tells us that it was his plan from the very beginning of time um, that God predestined us to be sons and daughters. Um, and through this book, we'll, we'll see, um, it says, uh, one of the titles are the mystery of the gospel revealed and how beautiful it is, how Christ unites Jews and Gentiles, one family now. Um, and it's no longer that separation in verses 15 through 23, the first chapter, Paul goes into a prayer and thanksgiving to God for the church and commends them for their faith. He prays that these followers would not just know this, but personally experience the power and the fullness of the gospel. That they would be empowered and encouraged that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the church also raised us and seated us with him. And uh, that's how chapter one ends. But we can go um, a little overview of uh, cha in chapter two. Paul reminds the Ephesians of their dead state. Okay, so talks about God, talks about Christ, the deity of Christ, the triune work of salvation. Chapter 2 talks about us, and Paul's talking to, to the Gentiles. He's reminding them, um, Paul reminds the Ephesians of their dead state before they believed. This is the state of which every one of us is born into this fallen state of sin, by nature, children of wrath right? So Ephesians 2 will talk a lot about um, our old life, right? So this is who we were before Christ. Um, we were uh, sons of disobedience, haters of God, following the prince of the power of the air. Um, and the most beautiful statement in chapter 2, and we say it a lot, is but God, right? So there's this pivot, there's this, um, here's you dead in sin, but God being rich in mercy, um, we were dead in our trespasses, but we are now made alive. Paul continues on to the point that since we were dead, we couldn't come to God on our own because, well, dead people can't make decisions, right? Uh, so God must first regenerate us or make us alive spiritually before we can believe. This is a gift of God so that no one may boast. It goes on to talk about that too, and we'll learn a lot more in depth about that. Um, this means that you cannot attribute any part of salvation to yourself. It is all solely the work of God by grace through faith. So he's reminding these people, both Jew and Gentile, that there's no work you can do. This is not, you can't really boast in yourself and say, I'm better than this one or I'm more saved than this one because it's not even your work of being saved. It was all Christ. It was all God. And we're only saved by grace through faith. Um, so not only have you been shown grace, but you are also invited to a new family. This is this is what how Paul um, puts it in um, chapter, yeah, in chapter two still. Um, so before, before hearing about Jesus, these Gentiles were not only cut off from God, but also cut off from his covenant people or the family of Abraham. Uh, the commands of the Mosaic covenant 
formed basically a barrier or a boundary line around the family that kept most Gentiles away. Now, as Paul puts it, you who were once caught, cut off have been brought near. Christ has broken down the walls of hostility. He is the one man in place of the two and has reconciled us both to God, unified as one body. Uh, Christ himself being the cornerstone or the foundation for being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And then it goes into chapter 3. Chapter 3 is the mystery of the gospel revealed. Paul marvels at the unique role that he was given to spread the good news to the Gentiles. Even though he is in prison, he's thanking God for being able to see the covenant family of God grow. So Paul's in prison and he gets to see the fruit right? He gets to see how Jew and Gentile are brought together. And he's telling them this and encouraging them in this um, so that they would put away um, their selfish thinking of, uh, well, I'm better than this one or this one's better than that one. I'm truly in the family of God. This one's not really. Um, even though he's in prison. So in closing the first half of the letter, right? So one through three is the first half. In closing the first half of the letter, he goes into another prayer. And this time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by the Spirit to know and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. And then we go into chapter 4, which could be the second part of this letter. So remember how we said uh, 1 through 3 is here's what you should believe. And now 4 through 6 is this is how you should live according to what you believe. So it's a lot of um, him teaching uh, the Ephesians how their conduct should be. Um, and how they should live now. Chapter 4, the second half of the letter begins with Paul challenging the readers to now respond to the gospel, right? So now you know the truth, and now you have to respond to it. Paul shows us here how to apply this wonderful truth to our lives, uh, and it starts with this therefore, the word therefore. Paul emphasizes that the church is one. One is the key word in this chapter. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Lots of unity, but that doesn't mean uniformity. And what do I mean by that? Is that um, unity doesn't mean that everybody has the exact same role in the church, right? Uh, doesn't mean that everyone has the same role. He talks about different parts of one body and how they all work together to build up the church. What Christ says the head. This metaphor is what Paul will continue to show us through these next couple chapters. And Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like old clothes, and put on their new humanity in which the image of God is being shown in their lives. Right? So we're no longer dead. We're no longer living in these dead bodies. And there's no reason. Um, I mean, physically, we're still in these bodies, right? We're still in this sinful world, but we now need to put on... Uh, Christ to put on to put Christ on and he's challenging them in this chapter um, to live now according to what you believe don't don't just say you believe it or just listen to it or uh, just have this word in your minds but be renewed um, so we're going to read this is four verse uh, chapter four verses 22 and 23 to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Paul then goes deeper into this by comparing the old and the new. Um, he says now instead of speaking lies, we are to speak truth. Instead of anger, we are to have peace. Instead of stealing, new creations in Christ are to be generous. Instead of gossiping to encourage one another, instead of looking for revenge, we are to forgive one another and so on. The whole idea here is that now that the believer has been born again and made new in Christ, we are to walk in love and forgiveness as he has loved and forgiven us. Um, and that's how chapter four really comes to a close. It, it's so beautiful and I'm so excited. I can't wait um, till the girls start sharing uh, more of these studies and we get to see uh, and as we read for ourselves and study for ourselves to see like the more in-depth stuff of these things. Like I'm just doing an overview and I was like blown away by the things I was reading. Um, chapters five and six gives us further instruction on how to live out this new life. Paul, give, Paul 
talks about how husbands must treat their wives and likewise how wives should act towards their husbands. He also gives us the examples of like bond servants and masters. Uh, he talks about the conduct of children and parents. And the reason um, we're given these two examples is because this is the way, like, um, like how it says, like, uh, wives respect your husbands and submit to your husbands and husbands love your wife as yourself and put her before yourself. Well, Jesus uh, is, is the groom and the church is the bride, right? So Christ gave himself up for us. He put us um, before himself and he loved us and we're to respect him and the church is to respect Christ and um, to listen to him and to obey him. Uh, and then he gives us these same examples. It's pretty much the same idea with the bond servants and the masters. Um, now, during this time, what I thought was interesting, me and Chanel was talking about this. Uh, during this time, he also wrote uh, Philemon. And Philemon is a story about um, there was this slave who he left his slave owner and he ran away. He was a runaway slave and got arrested. He was actually in prison with Paul at the time. And uh, Paul preaches the gospel uh, to this runaway slave and they, and they get saved. And he finds out that he was actually the slave of uh, his friend, his co-worker in the faith, uh, Philemon. So he writes this personal letter to Philemon and, and tells him about how uh, his, his servant got saved. And uh, he actually sends this, the same slave, he sends him back with this letter to Philemon and tells him... Um, you know, about how uh, he reads the letter about Paul tells him how he got saved and uh, he's reminding Philemon who he is and uh, his new his new identity in Christ and how he, we are to forgive and to love one another. Um, and I thought it's interesting that he talks about it here in Ephesians too. And um, he even gives talks about the conduct of children and parents. So we, we know that God is our father now through adoption. We have been ad adopted into the family um of god and think of like your father right so we are to respect our parents um like in, in the commandments it talks about this too and even though we don't follow the law to be saved but we look we, we hold regard the law as holy and obey god because he saved us that's the most beautiful part uh, and he talks he goes a little bit more detailed into that and then Paul closes the letter with the armor of God, which I'm very excited to learn about in its proper context. I only heard about the armor of God, um, you know, in, in one of those um, faith and prosperity ways. And uh, uh, we call it the Narsa Jesus way where it's about me. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to get into the to armor of God study and uh, really see how the girls take that one apart and go verse by verse and study it. Um, so this book truly is one of our favorites and almost every single teaching we've done so far has Ephesians 2 in it. Uh, it is truly the gospel revealed and it's um, my personal favorite uh, way Paul gives the gospel uh, in this book. And I pray that uh, you would all continue with us studying in this book and looking into its intended meaning and growing in sanctification through his word. Um, so if you guys haven't heard... <laughs> anything else I said, if anything I said doesn't make sense, um, I think the, the three main themes of this letter, Christ has reconciled all creation to himself and to God, right? These are the three main points. Uh, number two, Christ has unified, uni united people of all nations to himself and to one another in the church. And then the third one is Christians must live as new people. And these are the three main themes that we'll see throughout this letter. And I am so excited. Um, I really can't wait to get into it. Um, I know next week is going to be amazing. I don't know if they're, they're probably going to do like a two parts to it because it's, it's pretty big. Um, but it's really wonderful. I'm very happy to be back on live stream, uh, back in the word of God, back in our studies. I pray that you, all you girls would... Get into your word and um, read the Bible because it, it is, we, we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we have it. We have the, the Bible complete. We have all prophecy fulfilled. We have all the works of Jesus. We have it all in our house. 
on our phones. Um, and we've been neglecting to read it. I used to read this. Um, I used to read the Bible and just read it like when I wanted to hear something uh, good or I wanted uh, the Bible to say what I wanted it to mean. Um, but since the Lord opened my eyes and I pray that he would open all of our eyes and our hearts um, to read his word and to seek him for who he truly is, um, that is when my life changed for good. Um, and you see the fruit of it. So I, I pray that you would all pray with us, keep us in prayer as we do this study. I pray that you guys would study with us. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. That's, that's the end of it. That was the overview. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to DM us. We'll help you out with it um, as best as we can, pointing you to scripture. Uh, and then Friday we do a phone line where you guys could call in and uh, we pray and we take up prayers and testimonies and then um, one of the girls uh, will teach. I don't know who's teaching this week, uh, Friday, but we're, uh, that starts at Friday at 10. Um, so I'm very happy, very excited. God bless you guys. Um, I guess we'll pray us out. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you've given us. To, our privilege and our duty is to read your word, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you've given us housewives um, the knowledge to know you, Lord. You granted that to us. I thank you that you granted us salvation when we didn't deserve it. I thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Um, Lord of sinners, I am the worst, Lord. And I, I thank you, Father, that you've brought me so far. Um, and you brought all of us so far. We were all in um, places of um, just hatred towards you, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you brought us out of it. And I'm praying for those, Lord, your sheep um, who have not heard the gospel yet, Lord. I pray that you would use us and use your people, Father, to preach your word boldly, wholeheartedly, Lord, without holding back so that your people um, might hear the gospel and be saved. We thank you for this night, Father. Thank you for all my sisters in Christ. I pray that you would um, bless them and their families, Lord, and continue to give them strength and uh, wisdom, Lord, through these studies. I pray that you would um, let your word speak for itself, Lord, that we wouldn't add anything to it or take away, but that your word would just speak um, what you wanted to say, Father, and that we would read it with its intended purpose. Um, I'm praying, Lord, for... This new presidency, Lord, we don't know. We're all afraid. Um, we're all um, worried that um, with this new president in office that uh, life is going to be worse than what it was. But um, we need to remember, Father, that you are, you are king, Lord. You are the ruler. You are the authority. You put rulers in place. You put people in these positions, Lord. And there is nothing out of your control. And I thank you, Father, for that. I thank you, Lord, that... Um, you are in control, Lord, and nothing surprises you. Um, I pray that you would give us peace, Lord, and strength through these hard times. Um, I'm praying for all the missionaries, Lord, who are um, out in these countries, Lord, preaching your word. Some who are even in prison um, for preaching your word or for reading your word, Lord. I pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them through this time. I'm praying for all those who, who lost someone recently, Father. We're praying for all these families who lost loved ones. Uh, I pray that you would heal their heart, Lord, comfort them, give them peace, joy, understanding, Lord. Uh, I thank you for all that you've done, Father, in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, girls. Um, very uh, excited to get into this, so let's, uh, let's hurry up and finish these studies. <laughs> God bless you guys. Good night. Again, if you have any comments... Or questions or anything you uh, need help with, DM us um, this account on Woman of the Word. And um, make sure you guys are all on Friday. Um, let's get together and we'll pray and listen to his word. Um, so that being said, good night.